Welcome to another edition of Our City. I want to thank Mary Rivera and the Thomas Jefferson Arts Academy for coming to the office and taping these shows while we're in a little bit of a transition moving over to the Jefferson Arts Academy for permanent taping. A few things going around the city of Elizabeth this week. On October 25th at 6 o'clock in the evening, I'm going to attend a Greenhouse Project fundraiser. This event will be held at the Urban Griddle on the corner of Maple Avenue and Route 1 in the city of Elizabeth. And the fundraiser is for the Greenhouse at the Elmore Library and the micro farm that's located in the rear of the Elmore Library. If you want any more information on this event, please call Groundwork Elizabeth at 908-289-0262. Following that event, I'm going to attend the YWCA's annual Empty Place at the Dinner Table event. This will be held at Kane University in the Myron Student Center in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's an annual campaign coordinated by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. On a Friday, October 26th, around noon, I'm going to be the guest speaker and the keynote speaker at the Road to Clean Air Seminar at the Rutgers Center for Law and Justice. We talk about not only the necessities of maintaining the port activities, but also restoring as much as we can of the estuary that exists in the city of Elizabeth at the Arthur Kill. And on Monday, October 29th at 11.30, I'm going to present a proclamation in honor of World Stroke Day. This will be held at Trinitas Regional Medical Center. The designation, along with community efforts, help raise awareness and promote education as it relates to strokes. And on Tuesday, October 30th, which is also on the eve of Halloween, at 5 o'clock, I'm going to attend the annual Harvest Fest. It will take place in the Bank of America parking lot on Jefferson Avenue. This free community event is hosted by the City of Elizabeth, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Recreation and the Office of Youth, and Union County Freeholder Sergio Granados is also playing a role as a host. This event will feature free food, hayride games, costume contests, entertainment, music, and much more. So for more information, please call 908-820-4051. If you need more information concerning these events or any other events, please call our public information office at 908-820-4124. And please stay with us after these messages where we're going to talk about Estuary Day. Our city. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Craig Donovan, a professor at Kane University 
and the founder of the Elizabeth River and Arthur Kill Watershed Association. Dr. Donovan, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure, Mayor. I know you always take time out to come, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, great pleasure. And I'm also joined by Mr. Glenn Lautenbach, a watershed scholar and a trustee of Future City. Glenn, welcome back. Uh, thank you for having me. And you always come, Glenn. <laughs> yes. You started off as a young kid in this organization. Yeah, I've been here for a few years now. I know, and you really enjoy this uh, this work. Yeah, it's always good. So, so Craig, uh, Dr. Donovan, tell us, Elizabeth Estuary Day, it's been 18 years. You've been here for all 18. I have. I know, you helped start this thing. And the students that have come through the system uh, have been educated. So if if you can tell us, how has it grown in the 18 years? It's grown tremendously. And, you know, if, if you want to look back at the beginning, I want to thank you because you were instrumental in getting this started 18 years ago and have obviously been a, a very strong proponent and supporter of this, for which we want to thank you very, very strongly. One of the things, when we first started 18 years ago, I believe there was a perception that uh, the environment was on the mend, the air had been clean, the water had been clean, and this was something a little almost behind us. And we've recognized over the years that for all the progress that's been made, the situation has changed. The word climate change didn't exist when we first started 18 years ago. The concept that there would be an island of trash bigger than the state of Texas didn't exist 18 years ago. So it's really become clear that each year as the estuary day has grown and the involvement of the community has grown and the awareness of the people has grown, that this is something that stays with us and will stay with us forever and that each generation has got to be active and participating in making sure that the environment we live in is clean and they have a role to play in keeping it clean. It's not something somebody else somewhere else does. And there isn't a, a more beautiful area to see this than the estuary itself here at the Arthur Kill. And, and Glenn, you, you've been involved for quite a few, not only yes. 18, no. No, about eight right now. Eight, right. Yeah. And, and can you give us a quick review, October 5th, when we did Estuary Day and uh, what happens and what the partners are involved in, and what is your role as well, sure. Glenn? Sure, so uh, October 5th, we had different partners and about 13 different schools from across Elizabeth sent students to the Peterstown Community Center. Uh, the students would then engage in a variety of workshops through some of our different partners. Uh, some of those include the Army Corps and the Coast Guard. They talk about some of what they do in our local estuary. Um, we have people from Rutgers University discussing uh, mapping and geohealth and how that affects um, how we view our environment. Uh, we have actual high school students from Dwyer and Edison. They presented some information on um, hydroponic, solar technology, and process technology that they've been working on. We have people, uh, representatives from the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper giving some information on what they're working on. And we had members from uh, the city of Elizabeth uh, discussing some of the green infrastructure and some work they're doing with the CSOs with Pops Mac McDonald. And finally, we had members from the Elizabeth River Arctic Watershed Association discussing some of the fish advisory. Uh, so the day involves some of the students going around and, and learning a lot more about climate change and the estuary that's and the waters that are around them and hopefully uh, taking in some of the information and using it in their everyday life. Now you used a word called hydroponics. Is that yes. growing food without dirt? Um, I believe it's, it's sort of as little dirt as possible. I believe that was some work um, by the Dwyer Environmental Club. So that's what they've been working on. We're showing off so some of the other students. And you're going that. to school in this area, right, Glenn? I actually just recently graduated uh, from Rutgers in, for environmental science. For environmental science. Yeah. You're undergraduate degree. Uh, master's degree. You have a master's degree yes. now. Oh, good. So now you go for a doctorate and you'd be like this guy and teach? <laughs> Maybe. We'll, we'll see on that one. Um, the, the partners that responded to the progression in, in their important workshops with our students, how did you find the interaction working with the students and the partners? Did they learn the partners willing to teach? Because we're going to have Lisa Barron on in the second half of the show mm -hmm. from the Army Corps of Engineers, and they're always very supportive as well. Yes, uh, I think we found, especially over the years, uh, like Craig mentioned, this, this change in, in growing climate change uh, information that we want to get out, that a lot of the partners are taking that and giving a lot more information on that, on uh, climate change and what students can do. And a lot of the students, I think, are taking the information uh, a lot more to heart over the years. So, ask, is climate change real? Very real. Yes. 
Absolutely. There, there's no doubt that the environment that, that we're experiencing today is not what you and I knew as children growing up. Uh, the hurricane we've just seen hit the Florida panhandle. Uh, the violence of the number of hurricanes are just examples of when you have a warmer climate overall, how the weather gets more extreme, more drought, bigger drought, longer drought, more violent rains, stronger storms, more storms, and that this is continuing. We, we have, we're not sure where the end in sight is, if we can bring things back from the brink or if they're going to get even worse as times go on. So as a recently graduate in environmental science, do they, unlike when Dr. Donovan was going to school, do they teach climate change? Um, it, it definitely is acknowledged and it is part of some of the information you will uh, learn, especially if you're looking into that meteorology or the weather side of your classes. When you were going to school, they didn't, that was never mentioned, right? I, well, yes. And it's been a few it, years it was, since you went I to school. I was around when they started Earth Day. Okay. And I remember the very first In the Earth 1970s. Day. And I had professors teaching me back then that part of this was that they were beginning to see evidence that human beings were affecting the planet. And, you know, partially it was through the pollution. I mean, that was the major focus then. They weren't thinking climate. But that the planet was changing because of what people were doing and that we had to think about how to prevent the planet from getting worse because of what people did. And of course, the growth in the number of people. Uh, they, they were projecting the growth into the billions of people and that this has an impact. So I remember hearing it um, way back when. So climate change is not a hoax per perpetrated by the Chinese? Uh, no, it's not a hoax uh, perpetrated <laughs> by anybody. It, it, it is in fact very sadly real. Can, from a policy perspective, Dr. Allen, why is it important to provide this information for young people? Well, number one, they need to understand that the world they're going to grow up in is changing and that they have a, a big role to play in if it changes for the better or for the worse. They need to understand what they need to do and can do to help prepare for things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there will be another Sandy, there will be another hurricane that hits this area and they need to understand what they need to do to prepare for that, but what they need to be a part of as part of the community to prepare Elizabeth and the Arthur Kill and all of this area so that when the next Sandy comes, we're better prepared than we were the last time rather than worse prepared. So uh, Glenn, you just heard Dr. Donovan talk about climate yes. change and how to be prepared. Uh, so climate change and information, and he talked about Sandy, is, is there other areas? How do we apply it locally? I mean, what, the average person reads about climate change and they're like, you know, it's not going to affect my day-to-day -day life. That's right. what they think. But so how do we, how do we apply that locally? Well, I think one great thing that happened this session where uh, was, was that the Board of Education uh, came and they gave a challenge and initiative to the students that were attending and they were actually interviewing uh, some of the students on what they would do uh, to sort of affect and help combat climate change in their own lives. And they gave the challenge for students to think of one thing to do at their school and one thing to do at their home to sort of combat against climate change. And what do you think some of those things should be? Uh, I think one thing that we are looking uh, a lot on at Estuary Day especially is litter um, and that we call Estuary Day a litter-free event that we're trying to make sure everyone to sort of combat uh, that litter because that anything that gets left out uh, much more easily gets swept into our Elizabeth River and Arthur Hill. And whenever you talk about litter, I know, Dr. Dunham, you're probably tired of me telling that story, right? You remember growing up about the big Indian who uh, would stand on the side of the road and cry. Chief Iron Eyes Cody, yes. Oh, you remember the name of the Indian? I remember. Oh, you're better than me. <laughs> uh, and, and then people would cry when it. Indian would, the Indian would cry when people would throw garbage out on the freeway yes. or the highway. So it was a pretty moving commercial for me as a 10-year-old. I remember watching it. I, I never littered after that. Well, uh, Can we do that again? Can we come up with a commercial that shocks the conscience of young people for the environment? I think we can. I think we should. Uh, we tend to think that 
we did all of that. We learned our lessons. We, we got the EPA, the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. This isn't something we really need to think about anymore. And it's really not true. Every generation needs to learn that same message that the environment, it's one planet. We all live on it. There, there's one ground, there's one water. It's all we've got. And so I may not have put that piece of litter on the ground, but that's my ground it's on. And we all need to play a part in cleaning it up and picking it up. Uh, removing single-use plastic. Um, if you, whenever you have a choice, use clean energy, use clean electricity. Um, anything that you can do makes a difference. And when there are billions of us all doing it, that's what changes the world. So in conclusion, what's the next steps? We just keep building on Estuary Day. How do we educate more? What are the next steps? Well, I think going to what you were saying about the commercial is that we need to make it part of how we raise each generation to see the environment, to care about the environment, to ask, how do I make things better, to include it in the curriculum um, from first grade all the way through so that as adults, it becomes a second nature to us as anything else and that we recognize we all have a role in this. What do you think, Glenn? You're a little younger than the two of us. What are the next steps from a young person's perspective? No, I, I think that's, that's some of the most important parts, recognizing it's happening and starting to incorporate um, steps for your individual self uh, to try and combat it and then trying to hopefully, now that you have that information, apply and act to do some things locally and regionally. Dr. Donovan and Glenn, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us on the show. For the second half, I'm going to be joined by Lisa Barron, who's been a great partner in these efforts in Absolutely. the Army Corps of Engineers. But thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Please stay with us after these messages, where I'm going to be joined by Lisa Barron of the Army Corps of Engineers, a great supporter in the city of Elizabeth of the efforts on restoring the estuary. back to our city where I'm joined by Lisa Barron of the Army Corps of Engineers. Lisa, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. You've been on, the, on numerous times. How long now are you with the Army Corps? Uh, I've, I'm only there 11 years now. But you've been involved in this for a while. Right? I have. Before that, I was with uh, New Jersey DOT for 10 years where I was a sponsor for many of the projects, right. some of which I manage now for the Corps. So tell me, Lisa, about your involvement with the Army Corps of Engineers and estuary deer day here in the city of Elizabeth. Well, that is one of my favorite days, along with Environmental Day, to come to. I know, you come every year. We think it's great. Yeah, yeah. We really love to do it, and especially to, to work with the kids. And, uh, and basically what I do is I, I end up giving a lecture to them 
about, about the estuary, the importance of the estuary, and trying to uh, get them to understand what the Corps of Engineers does in the estuary and our many missions that we have so that when they think of a career in the future, you'd say there's so many different activities that the Corps does uh, with respect to um, whether it's navigation and dredging a harbor and deepening the harbor for the port or whether it's ecosystem restoration that I primarily focus on or flood risk management where we're trying to protect communities and uh, rivers from damage from flooding um, as well as other activities like we're out there dre um, taking debris out of the water so that we make sure that the navigation is safe or responding to natural disasters and doing emergency response actions. So there's so many different things that we do um, to be able to say you can do so many different things in your career that you can have a future at the Army Corps of Engineers. So Lisa, someday. tell me, how, how have you seen the growth of the students through the years that you've been working on Estuary Day and Environmental Day here in the city of Lisbon? Because it wouldn't be a success without people like you. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I actually, you know, there's always seems to, it feels like it grows and grows with the number of students, but, you know, always around like 240 students or so. But uh, the idea that it's ranging from like sixth grade to seniors in high school, I think that they are much more aware. Um, I always start out with, you know, okay, who knows what an estuary is? And in the beginning of the day, they, they don't know so much um, as to uh, the technical aspects. But by the end of the, the end classes, they're so much more informed and educated uh, to really understand what the, the importance of the estuary and, and even just technically um, what all the different organizations that are participating, what, what they're doing as well. So right after this next question, we're going to roll in a video. But how is the estuary restoration project going from your perspective and the Army Corps' perspective? You know, I, I'm really happy to report. I've been on the show so many times where I've talked about the the release of the Comprehensive Restoration Plan and, and how that was a, a blueprint and all the different restoration opportunities in the region. And we released uh, a draft feasibility report back in February of 2017 where we recommended 33 restoration sites out of the 296 that were identified. And we had to do a lot of work to refine that recommendation and we just went down to Washington DC in September where we had to uh, request approval to proceed with the, the restoration opportunities um, and the restoration recommendation. And so we created the video that you mentioned, we put together to really sell the importance of the estuary. It's going to be great for your viewers educationally from the standpoint of uh, what the, you know, what has, what has impacted the estuary and all the problems as well as what we're trying to do and, and recommend to restore it. And so try to really sell our restoration program and we were, we were really successful um, and ready to move ahead. But I think now would probably be a good time to show the video uh, to let everybody uh, get So we're going to watch a five minute video and then we're going to come back and talk with Lisa about that right after this video. Stay tuned. Each year, millions of visitors from around the world visit New York City, the Big Apple. They come to see its iconic sites, the Empire State Building, New Jersey's Liberty State Park, and the Coney Island Boardwalk. They stroll along Fifth Avenue and sprawling Central Park. They visit the Bronx Zoo and walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. Visitors are often struck by the juxtaposition of this bustling modern metropolis and the natural beauty of the region's ecological backdrop, the Hudson Raritan Estuary. Our nation's estuaries are unique places where fresh and salt water mix, creating vibrant habitats for marine life and scenic spots for recreation. The New York City metro area is nestled within the Hudson Raritan Estuary, where the Hudson River meets the Atlantic Ocean. The estuary contains one of the most intricate natural harbors in the world. From the marshes of Jamaica Bay to the New Jersey Meadowlands, the estuary is a diverse mosaic of habitats. It is home to hundreds of bird and fish species and thousands of plants. Dozens of them are designated as threatened or endangered. They include the red knot, piping plover, least tern, sea beach amaranth, and Atlantic sturgeon. The estuary acts as an important nursery and rest area for migratory birds along the long journey north on the Atlantic Flyway. 
The estuary is one of the world's premier examples of nature's resilience in a human-dominated landscape. Over 13 million people, one out of every 25 Americans, reside within a 25-mile radius of the Statue of Liberty. Many millions more do business in the region. Businesses in the New York City metro region generated $1.7 trillion in gross metro product in 2016. The Port of New York in New Jersey is the largest port on the east coast of North America and the third largest in the nation. To support the nation's waterborne commerce, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completed deepening the harbor's channels to a depth of 50 feet in 2016. The fragile waters of the Hudson Raritan Estuary have been greatly changed by centuries of progress. Beginning in the early 17th century, wetlands, rivers, and shallow water habitats were filled, dredged, channeled, and dammed. The estuary was radically transformed in the 19th century as the region grew into the nation's epicenter of the American Industrial Revolution. Water quality suffered as the population expanded. Overfishing led to a massive decline in fish and shellfish. Introduced invasive species like Phragmites reedgrass still dominate many natural areas. In the 20th century, industrial chemicals such as PCBs, DDT, dioxin, and mercury were dumped in waterways, causing persistent contamination. 99% of the historic extent of freshwater wetlands and 85% of coastal wetlands have been lost. 2,000 acres of Jamaica Bay Marsh Islands have disappeared since the early 20th century alone. 200,000 acres of oysters in New York Harbor are now nearly extinct. Ecosystem services provided by the estuary, such as water quality improvement and storm surge buffering, are limited due to impairments. Climate change also threatens to change the landscape. With its complementary ecosystem restoration, navigation, and flood risk management missions, the Army Corps is a leader in collaborative water resource planning. Recognizing the need to address long-term degradation, Congress authorized the Army Corps in the 1990s to undertake six studies into how best to restore the estuary. To support this effort, the Army Corps and an interagency group finalized the Hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan. The plan is the blueprint for the estuary's restoration. Since the 1990s, the Army Corps and its local sponsors have restored many imported areas to support the plan's goals. Dredged material from the Harbor Deepening Project was beneficially used to restore more than 160 acres of Marsh Islands. Shorelines fronting critical infrastructure were stabilized in Jamaica Bay. Offshore fishing reefs were created. The six studies were consolidated into one effort for efficiency. The resulting study's proposed plan calls for the restoration of coastal and freshwater wetlands, riparian habitat, oyster reefs, coastal and maritime forests, and fish passageways. The plan will provide an opportunity to address the long-term degradation of the estuary and achieve the shared vision of a world-class harbor estuary with the complementary goals of achieving ecosystem restoration while enhancing resiliency, navigation, commercial viability, and security in the region. The Army Corps thanks its non-federal sponsors committed to completion of the feasibility study and restoration of the estuary. Lisa, that was a great video. Now, some of the things that are in that video talk about the uh, estuary going from the Hudson River to the Raritan River. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth's right smack in the middle. Right. Tell us about the efforts we're doing in this area as well as what's going on in that video. Well, I know that we look at the estuary as a whole and there's a lot of projects that we're recommending uh, in, in the New York side, but also in the New Jersey side that's somewhat closer to Elizabeth where hey, we're talking about it showed the, the deepening of the harbor and everyone experienced. Which was important to us. Very important. Right across the river you have, you have a container terminal that's, that's bringing in all sorts of goods that, that the community needs to make sure that, that it uh, gets all of the, the important goods at, in the most cost effective way. As well as way. further up part of those with Port North. Yeah, Port, Port Newark and Port Elizabeth. So as you head into Newark Bay. Now right around there, you know, I'm, we're focused on 
as well as the dredging, but looking at bringing back the habitat in those regions. So looking at Oak Island Yards and Kearney Point, uh, as well as two sites on the Hackensack River to, to restore and bring back habitat. Because that probably is one of the most, um, most historically impacted areas with respect to the loss of, of, of habitat. And well, nobody would think the Meadowlands are part of the estuary. Well, the, you know, yeah. the Meadowlands, it's always been like an entity onto its own, but it's real, it's the estuary. Right, right, I mean, it's just upstream. So when you have improvements that take place upstream and you improve the wetlands and the habitat, you're improving habitat for the fish communities that are moving and migrating through through the estuary as a whole, as well as improving the water quality as the water is filtered through those plants, and it just provides um, you know improvement from for the for the estuary as a whole as well, um, even into the area of the Arthur Kill and the, the city of Elizabeth for your community. So Lisa, I want to thank you for the video. I want to thank you for your commitment to the city of Elizabeth. Uh, and I want to thank you for the commitment to bringing back the estuary as well as maintaining port activity. The Army Corps is doing a great job in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank Lisa Barron from the Army Corps of Engineers as well as Dr. Craig Donovan and Mr. Glenn Lautenberg who were on the first segment of the show. And we'll see you next week on another edition of Our City.